The subprime mortgage crisis of 2008. We know how it begins. We know how it ends. Millions of homes were foreclosed, making millions homeless. As firms went bankrupt, the United States fell into its greatest recession since the Great Depression. Even today, our recovery is not fully complete yet. Despite of these monstrous losses, not everybody suffered from this home crisis. Steve Eisman, one of the first men who knew something was wrong. Dr. Michael Burry, an Asperger's stricken introvert whose idea of a credit default swap made the mess profitable. Greg Lipman, the middleman behind it all. And last but not least, Charlie Ledley, a low profile investor who started with less than a fraction of a million, but came out with almost a few hundred million. These men bet against the system when nobody else would listen and ended up many times richer than before. My name is Michael Lewis, and I am here today to talk about the few, the very few who made billions of dollars from the losses of millions and millions of Americans. Today I have invited these men over, these four men, to be interviewed. In my view, subprime mortgage loans had long been de consistently decreasing in quality, and this trend was extremely unsustainable. Basically, all of the lenders around the world began to lose self-control, and they had developed a false sense of security from the huge number of loans and the short-term profits they were managed to make. Essentially, the crisis started when banks started writing out loans to people who essentially could not pay them back. Anybody could get a loan from the bank, no matter how low his credit and income were. The banks disguised these loans with impossibly low interest rates, but they skyrocketed up after the first few years. Of course, this change in rate was all in the fine print. Why would banks make such an offer? Short-term profit, short-term profit. Their greed started the machine and would eventually drive us to the ground. With these loans, they bundled them up and sold them investors in an invention, the mortgage-backed securities. And by doing so, the banks were transferring their responsibility of writing these crazy loans in the first place to investors. If any of these homeowners couldn't repay these pretty looking loans, it would be the investors who would lose their money. So one may ask, who would be willing to buy such bonds backed by these shady loans? The answer is nobody, but the banks have a way of disguising the quality of their loans, tricking the rating agencies to score the lowest quality of savings as AAA, the highest rating possible, using an invention called Collateralized Debt Obligation, or CDO in short. I find that really disgusting. What a CDO is, really, a machine that could turn lead into gold. By bundling up some of the worst mortgage-backed bonds with better ones, banks could get all of them to be rated all triple A, triple A. And they did that until most of their bonds were rated triple A. The rating system really was flawed, like really flawed. And the big banks found out and exploited these imperfections, imperfections. Although the banks initially made profit, this could not last forever. Eventually, and they knew it too. The loans would default, leaving millions and millions homeless and billions of dollars worth of bonds worthless. The crash was inevitable, just inevitable. Throughout my life, I've always taken a highly analytical and obsessive approach towards things that interest me. Along the way, I found many things easy to pick up. Medicines, computers, you name it. While I was in medical school, as a hobby, I began basically just blogging about investing, specifically value investing. I formed my own theories, posted them, and people actually started to listen to me. As more and more people began becoming interested, I decided to finally make the complete switch. Sure, medical school would be interesting at times, but eventually I just got tired of dealing with people alive or dead. In 2000, I dropped out of school, borrowed a sizable chunk of money, hunkered down in my basement, and basically just began reading financial statements. Thus began Scion Capital. Well, I, Steve Eisman, started out at Oppenheimer, a financial firm, because, my, because both my parents worked there. But as time went on, I had many experiences working with subprime mortgage lending, which is really just writing out loans to especially underqualified homeowners. It was working with these so-called special finance firms when I discovered the evil behind the system. 
After researching and researching, I decided to set up a hedge with firm hedge firm with Morgan Stanley to short the bonds created out of these loans. So basically, there are two types of investments. You can either long or short a stock. So when you go long, like in football, you bet that the company will be successful. When you short it, you bet against its success. So a hedge firm really is just a financial business specifically set out to short stocks. And essentially, I'm the middleman for a lot of these people, and I bargain to basically buy and sell to these hedge funds. That's what I do. So after I came up with the idea of shorting these subprime mortgage bonds, I looked all over opportunities to do so. It was hard to find any opportunities to directly short these bonds, as there wasn't a single investor willing to lend us bonds. Then I met Greg Lipman, who had this fantastic idea of credit default swap. It was pretty obvious that the downfall of these subprime mortgage loans wasn't going to happen overnight, but instead would happen on the long run. The credit default swap was an insurance, really. When once we purchased, would pay off if a stock or bond were to crash it in the next few years. It was cheap, just cheap and perfect. The most potentially lucrative approach towards shorting these lenders was to use credit default swaps. At this point, however, nobody in the world had ever tried to use credit default swaps on subprime mortgage loans before. In May 2005, I was pleasantly surprised. After formalizing a contract with Goldman Sachs, I started to use credit default swaps as a means to bet against the worst of the worst, the triple B rated tranches. Surprisingly, everyone else was fully willing to let me do so. And eventually in 2005, after I had built up a portfolio consisting of over $1 billion of these credit default swaps, word got out about my new strategy. Yeah, so I'm Greg. I, I trade bonds here at Deutsche Bank. So I I I've been called arrogant. I've been called blunt. I, I actually like that. So I, I have to admit this this credit default swap business, a lot of it was my idea. You know, I was I made this presentation called Shorting Home Equity Mezzanine Trenches, where I basically examined the home market and presented my argument. And a lot of people, you know, question me, they they uh, they tell me I'm wrong, they tell me I'm I'm a Zionist. And they ask me how I can do all these number crunching, this multivariable calculus, ooh, and stuff in my presentation. You know, you know what I do? I went to China and I found this guy, Eugene Zhu. He's this, this Chinese dude who wants second place in a national Chinese math contest. All of China, th this guy's number two. Yeah. You know, I, I love him. I trust him with everything. He, he's the best I've ever seen. I ask him to do anything, he will, he will crunch everything for me. And seriously, like, you have to trust him. Like, how can a guy who doesn't speak English lie? It was my idea. I still can't believe this Littman guy took my idea and published his own paper on it. So a big part about credit default swaps and the subprime mortgage crisis is that people think the whole thing has to collapse. But Eugene came to me the other day, Eugene, my, my bro Eugene, he's from China, China. And he gave me numbers and they shocked, they shocked me. So I realized, I came to this simple realization, the price, the housing market doesn't need to collapse. These, these prices, the homeowner prices, they just have to stop rising so fast at the pace they were. So house prices were still rising at this time around. November, you know, 2005, but default rates were approaching 4%. You know, if they rose to just 7%, you know, the lowest grade investment bonds, you know, the, the triple B minuses, they, they go to zero, they're wiped out. And if they, they, they rise to say 8%, the next lowest rated well, bonds on this tranche, on the CDO rated triple B, they go to zero. So it's November 2005, and I'm realizing that I'm okay with owning a huge pile of these credit default swaps on these subprime mortgage bonds. You see, they're not insurance anymore. They're, they're a gamble, and I love the odds. I want it to be short. My philosophy was to bet on whatever Wall Street thought was least likely to happen. 
Wall Street often underestimated the likelihood of some happenings, and from our bets on these, we'd win our bets more often than their predictions, and thus we'd win big sums of money, big in comparison to the money we would wager. With our initial $110,000, we won a lot, a few good million actually, but this was all before we discovered the subprime mortgages. Eventually, I took this philosophy to heart and bet against even the highest rated subprime mortgage loans. Everyone thought I was crazy, but as you can see, things all worked out in the end. In 2006, somehow my investors began to become impatient and mistrusting. In order to keep up on bets, I had to fire half my staff, leaving me more isolated than ever. Ultimately, one night, in order to realize the full potential of my investments, I was forced to lock up all of my remaining credit default swaps. Unfortunately, as the market fluctuated, I occasionally lost money, damaging my reputation and leaving many of my investors more irritated than ever. Eventually, in the middle of 2007, the tides began to turn, slowly but surely. In the middle of 2007, subprime mortgage loans across the nation began to fail. One by one, each of the bets I had made so carefully turned in my favor. At the end of August 2007, I began to fully repay my investors. By this point, I had more than doubled their money. As the market slowly began to tumble down, we were actually more apprehensive than overjoyed. Where could we store our money as banks were coming more and more insolvent? I was constantly getting migraines. We figured that there was something really wrong with democracy, and thus started my crusade to sue the rating agencies, donating the money we got to the investors who lost so much. AIG was one of the first companies to crash. After all, AIG FP, one of their sectors, had sold me most of the credit default swaps. They never expected the housing market to crash so badly. They just never did. They were driven by their greed. Well, anyhow, I finally showed everybody that they were wrong about, about the housing market, that I was right. But then they had already lost so much money that I started feeling a bit sorry. At the end of this entire ordeal, I had been proven right, yet somehow nobody cared to notice. My own investors said little, and the outside world said even less. Over time, Scion Capital became an empty shell, and in October 2008, I couldn't take it anymore. I simply closed Scion down, leaving me where I had began, as a single, lonely investor. To me, Asperger's Syndrome has been an invaluable gift. It has left me countless millions of dollars richer, but at what cost?